Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host, Peggy Nello. Today's guests are Leslie McWright and Rupendra Carr, audiologists from Albany Medical Center. Welcome to the show. Thanks Thank for you. coming in. Um, Leslie, why don't we start with you? Uh, let's define what an audiologist is. An audiologist is a licensed professional that tests hearing and fits hearing aids. Um, mm -hmm. The basic education um, used to be just a master's degree um, in audiology but now the degree is changing to a doctorate level position. Uh -huh. And the doctorate is? It's called the Doctorate of Audiology. An, uh, an AUD, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to PhD. That's correct. Okay, and you're both going towards your doctorates. Yes. Oh boy, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, today we're talking about hearing loss. So uh, Rupinder, why don't you talk about um, prevalence and incidence of hearing disorders? Um, how many in the United States actually have hearing loss? There's about 28 million in the United States that are hard of hearing or uh, hearing impaired. Mm -hmm. And uh, one third of these are over 65 years of age. And almost half, 40 to 50 percent, are over 75 years of age. Okay. And if we look at newborns, there's three to five newborns in every 1,000 uh, that has a hearing loss. And that's why in the year 2000, at least New York State started newborn hearing screening, where every baby is screened for hearing loss, because hearing loss happens to be the most, um, the highest incidence of uh, any kind of, uh, I would say, problem or deficit in a newborn. Mm -hmm. And it's an invisible hearing loss. Uh, it's an invisible handicap or impairment which goes undetected, sometimes up to the age of one or two years. And that's why the importance of newborn hearing screening, really, to pick up all the hearing losses at an early age. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to mention is um, it's greater in men as opposed to right. women, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay, Leslie, um, symptoms of hearing loss. How do you know that you're having a problem? When should <laughs> one actually consult a, a, a professional? Right. We, um, we end up seeing people long after they probably started having some symptoms of hearing problems. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's they're dragged in kicking and screaming by one of their spouses. Mm -hmm. um, basically, because they're always asking for repetitions, they're missing the punchline of jokes. Right. Um, they um, have to um, have the television or radio set at a volume so that the neighbors can right. hear it. And the spouse is tired of yelling. At yes. Them. <laughs> it's very frustrating for everyone. Um, yeah, sometimes the worst case scenario for an adult is that they stop participating and they start withdrawing because they don't have a good time because they can't be involved in that anymore. And so that's one of the most unfortunate things is that people start to withdraw into themselves and stop doing the things that they used to enjoy so much. Mm -hmm. And I would think it would be s embarrassing when you're in a public place and you're trying to, let's say you're at the library, you're trying to ask for a book and and you can't hear what the person is right. saying. And it they have to repeat, repeat. People e are so even though their spouse is used to it, um, the people in the public may not necessarily know the best way of dealing right. with them. Okay, so um, next let's talk about diagnosis. Rupinder, um, what exactly is involved with a hearing test? Um, what, is, what is done? If you came in for a hearing test, say to uh, a licensed audiologist, the first thing they would do is take an extensive history because you can glean a lot of information just by talking to the patient, finding out what hearing problems and what situations they're experiencing difficulties and challenges, um, what the onset of hearing loss was, how it mm -hmm. came about gradually or suddenly. Then they would look in your ears just otoscopically, check how your eardrums are moving, um, then go on to um, actual hearing tests in a soundproof booth where you get to put on headphones or insert phones and listen to some beeps, kind of um, respond either by saying yes or pushing a button every time oh, you hear okay. a soft beep. And uh, they would have you repeat some words. There's different kind of speech testing to see what your speech discrimination level is. And 
from doing all this, uh, they would generate an audiogram, and that uh, would be able to tell you what type of hearing loss you have, what mm. degree of hearing loss you have, and um, if they see a problem, they might refer you to an ENT or a doctor. If they see a problem, they may do some further more detailed testing. But that would be the basic hearing test right there. Okay. And that is, um, ha what, what is the difference between your situation at the Hearing Center at Albany Medical Center and, let's say, um, how, how does that test differ at, let's say, one of the other places uh, that sells hearing aids? Um, is it pretty much the same workup or? It depends. Every place, I think, does it differently, but m any audiologist would go through the entire test battery. Some of the people who are just dispensing hearing aids may cut short some of the testing and do just the pure tone testing, just mm -hmm. the beeps, and get an idea from there. Um, we being at the hospital, the focus is more on diagnosing the hearing loss and choosing the best hearing aid that fits the person's needs mm. and their hearing loss rather than just be focused on making a sale. Okay. Okay, Leslie, mm. you're next. Mm -hmm. um, types of hearing loss, can you first of all describe um, the ear, the, sure. the uh, <laughs> so physiology? In order to understand obviously what kind of hearing loss you have, we have to talk about how you hear. Um, so we have our little model of the ear, so we can figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, first, the sound is collected by your pinna, this part here. The sound then travels down your external ear canal, and then it's going to hit your eardrum, vibrate that. That sends the signal in a vibration form through little bones. Those are the smallest bones in your body, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. That's then connected to the inner ear. And the inner ear is a fluid-filled system that has little tiny hair cells in it. And these little cilia cells um, bend in response to the motion caused by that vibrating um, foot plate. Once that bending occurs in, these, in the um, cochlea, which is the organ of hearing, a nerve signal is sent up to the brain and you hear. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a problem in any part of this system. So you can have wax in your external ear canal and that can cause a significant hearing loss because the sound can't get in. Can you get complete hearing loss from wax? Complete is a strong word because the, the maximum amount of that is, is a pretty significant hearing loss, like a moderately severe hearing loss, but it makes you feel like you're deaf. Um, but if we compare that to a person who is deaf with no hearing, then you, it wouldn't be the same. Okay. Um, we go on in from there, you can have a problem with the eardrum. Maybe there was a perforation at one point. Um, maybe somebody has a middle ear infection, and that can cause a problem because the sound can't get through the, the infection. Um, and then you can have problems with the sensory part, which is um, called sensory neural. And that would be the more, most common type of hearing loss. And this is the area where when you talk about age-related hearing loss, as people age, typically that's the area that starts to degrade and you start to lose your sensitivity there. Hmm. Problems that occur in the external ear and the middle ear space typically can have a medical solution, meaning maybe there's a medicine you can take or there's a surgical procedure or something to improve that. So um, every time you go to an audiologist and have a hearing test and having hearing loss doesn't mean that a hearing aid is the solution to the problem. Hmm. Now, there's also um, accidents that can cause problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so things that cause hearing loss as well as just aging and being born with it, you can have an accident that would possibly damage one of the components, like mm -hmm. a head injury that kind of thing. Ototoxic medications, if you right. take some things for cancer treatments, um, sometimes heavy-duty antibiotics have been known to be ototoxic. Um, typically, if somebody's going to give you an ototoxic medication, then you've been informed of it. Um, so you would be told that that's a possible outcome. Um, so yeah. we know most of those. And they would probably monitor your hearing periodically, mm -hmm. just to see if your hearing is stable or is it going down, because it could change through the course of uh, treatment. Okay. Okay, next um, we're going to be talking about tinnitus mm. or tinnitus. <laughs> it can be pronounced either way, right? Okay, so who wants to start with that? Let's do a definition. Tinnitus is a ringing sound in the ears mm -hmm. without any external acoustic um, sound present, acoustic stimulus present. 
and different people experience it differently. Somebody mm -hmm. might describe it as a ringing, somebody might describe it as static. There are people who say it's like a waterfall, it's chirping, it's crickets. crickets. So everybody has a different uh, experience with uh, tinnitus. There is mm -hmm. no one set experience you can say that is tinnitus and the others are not. The degree of um, loudness that they may perceive may vary from person to person. Within the same individual, sometimes their tinnitus may get louder or softer. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's quieter or if they are stressed, it may seem louder than at other times. And it's just a perception. It's like a phantom sound, just like a phantom pain or phantom limb. Is it all the time? Again, it fluctuates. It probably is all the time, but there are people who have fluctuating tinnitus. There are people who will find it getting louder or softer from time to time, depending on what's going on in the environment, what state of mind they're in. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is, it, does it block you from being able to hear um, low sounds or high sounds it, or, or it's any, any kind of dialogue? It's a distraction for some people. So if it's, if it's loud enough for them that it starts to interrupt hearing a conversation or listening to music, it can, it can disrupt that way. Typically, mm -hmm. people are able to hear and have conversations above it, um, and it's more of an annoyance than, than it is a um, reduction in the ability to hear and understand things. But for some people, it is loud enough, especially for, for music, because mm -hmm. it, it can be there all the, it can be there all the time for some people. And studies have tried to measure how loud tinnitus is, and when they measure it, it's actually just a little, a step above the softest level that people can hear. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take the hearing threshold, tinnitus may be just two de decibels, five decibels above it, and that's about it. But the person may perceive it as being so loud that it just bothers them and is very, as Leslie said, very distracting or uh, annoying to people, and they get very frustrated with the whole percep perception of sound because they can't seem to get rid of it. And it's obviously a common annoyance if they're saying that some somewhere between 12 million and 50 million <laughs> Americans right. mm -hmm. are suffering from it. So maybe the difference in statistics might be due to um, lack of reporting the problem because right. maybe people just think, well, it's an annoyance, but maybe it's not something that uh -huh. a lot to be of treated people for. take tinnitus um, in their stride. They might say, okay, I have a ringing in the ears. If it's not bothering their day to day functioning, it's not impeding how they function every day, they kind of learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. and a lot of cases go uh, unreported or untreated. In fact, most of the people who come to us come with a primary complaint of hearing loss, not so much tinnitus. That may be just a secondary complaint they may happen to mention in their case history. Mm -hmm. Now, can that be affected by diet at all? Can, can you eat certain things? I've heard more protein. We laugh um, about, helps we're, we're laughing because we had a discussion about this earlier. We both are, have taken, and she's taking the class right now, on um, tinnitus. And mm -hmm. the person who teaches that class definitely let us know that there is no scientifically um, proven study that showed that low salt diets or any special diet will affect tinnitus. So, so there's nothing you can do to change not anything. Not your eating habits. To affect it. So sometimes there might be another condition that's causing the tinnitus, so that could, it could be caused by medications. Um, so there are possible, um, you know, problems in the auditory system that might be causing it mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so there is the possibility that a medication caused it, and if you stop taking the medication, it would make it go away. Mm -hmm. But as far as changing your diet with avoiding chocolate or red wine or all these other things that have been proposed, it, it doesn't make it so that scientifically with double-blind studies that it makes a, a significant difference in tinnitus perception. Okay, and then there's no other sort of herbal remedies or anything else. I've seen a lot because, um, you know, I have a relative that's suffering from it, mm -hmm. so, and they're saying, and well, you have to take this and then your tinnitus will go right. away. And I had a patient who said they came in and I take these vitamins and, I, and it goes away. And it worked for her, but again, the studies from that are using a scientific double blind haven't proven that a herbal remedy is able to make tinnitus significantly different. Though some studies do mm -hmm. mention a placebo effect and sometimes a person if they if they feel they're benefited by changing diet or changing their lifestyle, reducing stress, reducing caffeine, 
or in, uh, reducing the sodium intake or salt intake, well, if it helps them, so be it, because um, it's just a perception. Well, that'll it's probably help them in other ways, too. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then there is no hearing aid that can help you with that. Um, actually, one nice side benefit of hearing aids is that many people don't notice their tinnitus as much. Because it's amplifying the sounds around them, it's raising that up, and the tinnitus that was so audible to them is now a little bit softer and so they don't notice it quite as much. Mm. So for many people when they put on a hearing aid their tinnitus subsides a bit as far as perception is concerned. Right. And mm. that's a common recommendation that um, a lot of people will say avoid silence, kind of surround yourself with environmental sounds. Uh, some of my mm. patients have said I turn on the fan and it helps me go off to sleep because I don't hear my tinnitus so much or I turn on my AC and I don't some think I people would ever sleep. <laughs> Some people use n those crazy. tapes which have nature sounds like uh, running water, yeah, yeah. brook water or sea waves. Those seem to help some people. The yeah. idea behind that is that that noise is there all the time and your, your nerves and your ears are listening to that instead of this trying to pay attention to this annoying thing that's always there. Hmm. So it makes it less obvious. Okay. So next is hearing aids. Leslie, you're going to talk <laughs> about hearing aids. Um, I, I, think, I think one of the things we have to really discuss is um, the whole vanity aspect of them. And it's no longer a beige banana. No. It's <laughs> much, it, they're much more sophisticated mm -hmm. now. Um, so can you describe the different types? Sure. Um, so hearing aids have to go into an ear for you to hear it. The sound has to get in there. So we've got Basic components on all hearing aids would include the microphone, an amplifier, and a loudspeaker, and then they have to have a power source, so you've got to have a battery. Okay. And people are shocked sometimes when they realize they have to change a battery on a hearing aid. It's not like a watch where you put it on once a year and, and it goes. Mm -hmm. um, sound takes more energy to create. So it is something that you're going to have to think about if you get a hearing aid well, is that you have to have batteries. On, on average, how often do they need to be changed? Oh, that depends on the size of the... Um, battery in okay. the hearing aid. So we've got different sizes and I'll explain about the battery for each one and you mm -hmm. can guess that the larger the battery, the more battery life that you get. Um, so we go from sort of big to small here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a behind the ear hearing aid and then we have the little small new guys that are tiny in comparison to its bigger one over here. And this is one of the newer marketed hearing aids for mm -hmm. people to sort of combat that concern about cosmetics. Now, can you um, just put it in your ear so people can see how you really can't see it? Yeah. <laughs> and these days, so basically, it just hides behind there. Yeah, give me a second. I don't wear hearing aids, or fortunately for me, <laughs> or unfortunately. You see so people walking there. around with um, cell phones in the ears and Walkman. That I think it's becoming more and more acceptable to have something in the ear. Is that you can there? barely yep. see it, and mm -hmm. all there is is just the plastic. Just a little too the right there. And Great. so, with a little one like that, it feels very light. It doesn't fill up my ear very much, and that's the proposed benefit of this kind of styling is that it doesn't give you that plugged ear feeling that pe some people complain about, mm -hmm. and it is very lightweight, and so it doesn't really get involved with your glasses touching it and things uh -huh. like that. Are they all digital? Most of them are now. Um, okay. Not all hearing aids are digital. Um, years ago it was the inside was um, components of electrodes and diodes and things that would alter the sound in order to get a shaped response and a louder response and now there's a computer chip in most of them that acts as the brain that tells you know how, how loud it's going to be, what microphone is going to pick things up and, and all the information about amplifying mm -hmm. it. And is that the model that has all the different colors to it? This one does. Okay, so like one you can choose so. and they can even get a, a leopard print if yep. they want one yeah. <laughs> behind <laughs> their ear. Right, I and mean, that's the idea because this one is so discreet that they can choose to match their outfit. I think there's a color that's close to my jacket. I mean, there's all sorts of things for that. And that really is going towards people who are, you know, having a little, being more hip about it. Um, but, you know, we still, I, the majority of the instruments that we fit are still the, the standard behind the ear style and the, and the regular in the ear mm -hmm. styles. Um, when we get back to in the ear styles, we have ones that fill up all of the outside of, of this part of your ear 
they're a little bit smaller, and then the little teeny tiny ones that are called completely in the canal. And this was the vanity choice for years of getting something that's so little of that nature. Mm -hmm. And again, this one is very discreet, and you can barely see this one either. Hmm. But we don't fit many of these. <laughs> um, hmm. Hearing aids have advantages and disadvantages to them. The advantage of this one is cosmetics. The disadvantage is the little tiny battery. You have right. to change the batteries on these maybe every three days. Is three days? Three days. Whereas on this one, you might get two weeks. So that's one of the disadvantages of, of that. These instruments are deep into your ear canal, so they're more likely to get clogged up with wax and things as you put them down in. Mm -hmm. Hearing aids can be damaged by moisture, so you can't go swimming in them, you can't go out in the rain unless you use an umbrella, Power. and uh, your ear, we're warm and a little moist, so these are more prone to having moisture problems um, because of living deep inside your ear. Now, yeah. how many of these, I mean, I've seen people that are adjusting the volume on theirs. Um, how many of them can you actually adjust the volume on them? Um, Should you not have to do that? It depends. Some people have worn hearing aids for years and they're very comfortable with having had a volume control because that's what they had. In the past, hearing aids just made things louder and so if you went into a loud place, it was so loud they had to turn it down to protect mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. um, now the hearing aids with the, more the digital computer chip in them, they adjust automatically for how loud the incoming signal is and so you go into a noisy room and it automatically doesn't amplify as much. Mm -hmm. So they, you're not as tied to having have a volume wheel but some people still want it, and I it's, it's I nice I think a lot some. depends on the age and the lifestyle. For a child, for right. example, you may not want to give a volume control because if they accidentally were to turn it up or down while they're playing a toddler, the parent wouldn't even know it's set too high for them or too low. So if it's a child, we typically mm -hmm. would take away or deactivate the volume control even if the hearing aid has one. Mm -hmm. Elderly people with manual dexterity issues or other right. disabilities, sometimes you set them at a volume and deactivate the volume control just leave it or have a hearing aid without a volume control. As Leslie says, it will adjust itself in game and that's adequate for changing situations. Whereas somebody who has a lifestyle where they're going from one quiet listening situation to a very noisy situation to an mm -hmm. echoey situation, they may want the flexibility of a volume control. Hmm. So how do you care for a hearing aid? Um, some of the basic care is just wiping it off and keeping it dry. So you're going to wear it most of the day. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really sleep in hearing aids. Uh, so you would take it out at night, open the battery door, wipe it off. You put it, we often give a little dehumidifier to keep the hearing aid in and that's going to help dry them out so that moisture <laughs> doesn't build up and cause corrosion. Mm -hmm. And then I suggest to people that when you take it out in the morning, you look and see if there's any blockages in the sound tube. And if there's some blockages in the sound tube, you would clean it out with a little special tool. Mm -hmm. And so the, the care involved is protecting it, making sure it doesn't get wet, making sure you don't drop it and, and break it and then cleaning it so that it can work properly and then feeding it batteries when it needs them. Right. That must be the challenge. Now, silly question. If somebody's fitted for a hearing aid, does that mean that whatever part of it is fits exactly into their ear canal? Yes. The okay. So when you get a hearing aid, they're going to usually take an impression of your ear. Mm -hmm. That impression is, is made of a silicone mixture and we mail that off to the hearing aid manufacturer and they create the shell from that. That mm -hmm. shell is for your ear and your ear only. It won't fit your neighbor's ear. Mm -hmm. so. so let's say somebody gets their hearing aid, they take it home. Three days later, they either think, well, I can't really hear or this doesn't really fit me. What can they do? They go back to whomever gave them their hearing aid. And what would happen is that you would go back in and, and the audiologist or the hearing aid dispenser would figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just that they're holding the hearing aid the wrong way and they've got it oriented improperly and it's just a, a re-instruction. If okay. it's made incorrectly, let's say that it really is just a bend is in the wrong place, it can be recast. If the person decides that the hearing aid is just not going to work out for them, they have a 45 day trial period and they can return the instrument within that time. Hmm. Okay. I think we've covered everything about hearing aids. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so next, now you were saying that um, one of the things that causes 
hearing loss is um, loud sounds. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we protect our hearing? Supposedly the statistics are 10 million people in the United States have hearing loss due to um, loud sounds. Right. Noise exposure can come from work, but it also comes from hobbies and recreation. So at work, we should be protected by OSHA regulations and we should be provided with the proper protection to prevent hearing loss. And so we have things in place to protect us, um, but we, there are no regulations to protect us against ourselves. So we can choose to listen to our iPods very, very loud. We can choose to go to loud concerts without using hearing protection. We can choose to operate chainsaws and, and things without hearing protection and damage our ears ourselves. Um, so one thing to do is to use hearing protection. Um, mm -hmm. Another unfortunate thing with the hearing loss, um, tinnitus is more common in noise-induced hearing loss. And so not only do you, can you get hearing loss, you also can get the unfortunate ringing in your ears from uh, noise exposure. Um, so we brought a couple examples of the different types of um, hearing protection. I recommend that people use these for like mowing the lawn or doing those outdoor activities where it's really dirty and messy and you can just hang these on the wall next to whatever piece of equipment is exceptionally loud. So yeah. the, the leaf blower is right, really right, horrendous. Right. Yes, it is. Um, and these you don't have to worry about getting dirt in your ears. You just stick them on and they're right there and they're relatively inexpensive, maybe mm -hmm. $20 for a pair. Um, and then these are available in any pharmacy. I've seen them all over the place. They're just foam inserts and you squish them down and stick them in your ears and if you really like to go to loud rock and roll concerts, then bringing a pair like this with you would be a good choice. Um, there are more specialized types of hearing protection. There's stuff available for hunters that allows you to you know, hear the animals and then when you shoot, it reduces the sound. And so if you, if you have a specialized need, oh. you can get specialized hearing protection. Okay. So are you concerned about the advent of um, iPods and MP3 players and um, the, the fact that people are actually putting things inside of their ears and listening? Honestly, the thing that, that really concerns me is the safety factor. When I see somebody running on the side of the road right. or riding their bike on the side of the road, I think they're just going to not hear a car right. and get hurt. But from a professional like perspective, what do you think? Well, certainly those sounds that are now inside your ear canal are capable of really making a lot of force and causing damage. So for the loud room, that sound is now dispersed throughout the entire room. But when you've got it just in your ear, you've now got all of that just going for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to find some information about guidelines to say how loud. And, you know, this was a concern when Walkmans came out and people started listening with their Walkmans. And yeah. so it's the same idea, it's just a different means of getting that really loud sound to you personally. Mm -hmm. um, and so one, one guideline that I actually found was, if you consider that maximum volume is 10, try to keep it at six or below. Six or below. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's really no difference between, let's say, the headsets where it's on the outside of your ear and the earbuds that are on I've the inside of your ear. Are you more concerned about I'm earbuds? More, yeah. For me personally, I'm more concerned about earbuds because that's going in. The ones outside, they may disperse a little bit. It depends on how high of a quality though. Mm. If you've got really fabulous high quality earphones, they probably can drive a lot of force too. So just right. most, most people self-regulate. So supposedly most of us are thoughtful enough to go, wow, that's really loud. I should turn it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Rupinder. Um, Social aspects of dealing with hearing loss. Do you have any tips for families uh, with somebody who's hearing impaired? Sure. Hearing loss is uh, an impairment you see it as uh, an impairment that affects the entire family. It's not just the individual alone right. because it's what helps you or impedes your communication. And even though I may have a hearing loss, it's my family that's having difficulty trying to communicate with me. So mm -hmm. we would counsel not just the patient but the family as a whole, uh, give them some tips. Maybe the person who's trying to communicate to uh, the person with the hearing loss should speak a little slower, clearer, draw their attention before yeah, addressing slower them. Slower instead of yelling. Yelling right? does not help because <laughs> yelling changes the way you, your speech patterns have formed or the sound quality. 
And uh, a lot of people with hearing loss also sometimes have um, sound intolerance or recruitment, so yelling does not always help. But if you are clear and attract their attention, draw mm. their attention, and if the other person asks you to repeat, don't repeat the same sentence all over again. Maybe try and modify because they may have picked one or two words from the original sentence and you repeat it again and again, they're still missing the same part. Whereas if I'm saying, where did you put the keys, you might want to repeat it and say, I'm asking about the car keys. Wonder where you put them last time or just rephrase things. So there are, different are there certain sounds or letters, letter sequences that you think people miss more? Don't hear every time they're said? It depends on the hearing loss. Know. Typically, hearing loss is more common in higher frequencies. Mm -hmm. So high pitched sounds, female voices, or S's, T's are more high pitched. That's what people tend to miss more. Okay. And uh, in background noise, that always becomes a challenging uh, listening situation because you are losing all the right. better low frequency hearing you may have which is now being uh, camouflaged by all the background mm -hmm. noise and right. you're relying on your high frequencies where you do have a hearing loss. Um, so mm -hmm. if you can reduce the background noise, if you can uh, just have the person talk one-on-one -on -one with you. And there are different listening strategies which people can come up with together. What works for one uh, set of people may not work for another. Hmm. Interesting. We always ask that family members come with patients so that if it's if there's a spouse or a parent or a, you know the it's your parent your mother or father that you're worried about and and you're the one who's been nagging them to get in there if you come in you can see what their hearing loss is you can see and be told what to expect from that hearing loss and then you can learn is a hearing aid expected to be helpful where is it going to help and what are the realistic expectations from what's being suggested right well in fact that yeah. uh, uh, that really is uh, something one would like to emphasize as realistic expectations. A lot of people come to get a hearing aid and they think it's a fix-all. We'll get a hearing aid and I'll have my 16-year-old ears back and that's, that doesn't always happen. So you still have to modify your communication strategies. You have to modify the listening situation. You have to make your family aware that even though you have hearing aids, they shouldn't try and talk to you from three rooms down <laughs> and expect you to hear right. uh, that yeah. both you and your family need to have realistic expectations. And mm -hmm. that, I think, really leads to higher acceptance of hearing aids if you begin with what the hearing aids can do for me and what they cannot. Hmm. Well, the last thing that, that our viewers may be curious about is insurance coverage. Um, what is actually covered? <laughs> if you can sort of summarize. In general, most insurance companies will cover a hearing evaluation. Evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, most insurance companies do not cover hearing aids. Um, there are it some. Sounds crazy to me. I'm <laughs> sorry to say. But it is a shame. Um, it's a huge. It's a big financial undertaking for insurance companies to accept, and I think that they will fight it as long as possible. Um, but there are some exceptions to that. Um, if you're in New York State and you have Medicaid coverage, then hearing aids are covered okay. for children and adults. If you have children that have a hearing loss and they're on New York State Child Health Plus insurance, hearing aids are covered. Mm -hmm. um, certain, we're lucky, we live um, where a lot of people work for the state and the state has a hearing aid benefit that good. will cover a good portion of the cost for hearing aids. Um, but what do the costs range? It's a big range, um, anywhere from $2,500 for two all the way up to $6,000 for two and sometimes maybe even more. Um, so it's a pretty big price range mm -hmm. and I think that you can find things for less um, maybe through an advertisement or something and if you do get pulled in by an advertisement that says $999, um, be careful as to what they're offering because it, it may not be a comparable hearing aid and, and that's the question to ask. Um, it might not include follow-up or anything else like that? Typically, I think most places include follow-up in, in, in the hearing aid mm -hmm. that itself. Um, you know, we're obligated to make sure that the hearing aid is, is fitting and, and amplifying as well as much as it can. Um, and I don't think there's anybody out there, even um, certainly hearing aid dispensers where that's their primary function, have to rely on satisfied customers. Because there's that 45-day trial period, if mm -hmm. a person isn't happy, that, that can come back. 
Right. So hearing aid dispensers and audiologists really do strive to have people happy with their hearing aids. And most hearing aids come with a one-year warranty, so you have that period where you are kind of coming back to the audiologist if you have any problems and they can modify, adjust, reprogram the hearing aids so you get optimum use out of them. Hmm. Okay, well thank you very much for that information. Uh, the last thing we want to mention is just uh, some websites for further information. Um, they include, and uh, I'm just going to read this because um, you gave them to me, American Academy of Audiology, uh, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, uh, the Hearing Loss Association of America, the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf, the American Tinnitus Association, and the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. Okay. Thanks very much for coming, and good luck with your doctorate uh, degrees. Hope Thank everything. You. Hope you can still do your jobs and study at the same time. <laughs> it's difficult. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.